Can you hear it now, Alain? It's uh, oh, so I should I should. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ah, yeah. Perfect. All right. perfect. Okay. Okay. Anyway, I don't think that's the first part is too important. But anyway, just to say that this is when um, last year was when the first books came out in English um, in mainstream publishers um, about this. Uh, they were all very soon out of date because um, uh, what happened, these are two of my books that came out last year. What happened basically was that uh, uh, we had these diffusion models that came along and rendered the previous model GANs um, out of date. So all the illustrations are all out of date. And I guess these, these diffusion models started, they started kicking in, actually the very beginning was a roughly May of last year, but not available to the public until July. But anyway, so so this is all very, very recent. Um, I want to just address uh, some basic questions and my apologies for those who are experts here, but sometimes it's important just to go and touch on the basic things. Talking about where it came from and then kind of looking how it's been used in architecture. I want to touch on the dark side because I think it is, it is there is some terrifying about it and then offer 10 predictions about the future. Of AI that may or may not be useful to an architect. So, I think um, I mean this is uh, um, Margaret Bowden, University of Sussex. She was the kind of grand old lady who started talking about these things a while back. Um, and this is her definition of AI: AI seeks to make computers do the sorts of things that minds can do, um, which I don't think is actually accurate anymore. First of all, because AI can do more in certain domains such as games of chess and go than minds can do and secondly i don't think i don't personally believe that they need to do the things that minds can do they don't need to be conscious um as long as the machine does what it's meant to do you know as long as your toaster toasts your bread you don't need to be conscious um so i think that's a bit of a red herring um but um let's just say that that, that what's happening right now is uh is this thing called the, the deep learning the, the, the neural networks so on the right hand side is the artificial neural network and then the neural network of the, of the brain itself and these are called neurons and these are synapses and the flow of information from left to right is governed by the weights on these synapses um and these deep, deep learning refers to the number of hidden layers that can be up to five thousand. it can be um enormous. the huge crucial difference though between these two is 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 that ai is not conscious it's not sentient it has no consciousness um it doesn't know what it's doing um, it can beat us a chess or go, it doesn't know it's doing that at all. It doesn't think. Um, whether it needs to think is not the question. Um, so, um, and if you ask most people, think of a by AI, certainly until ChatGPT came along, they'd think of, of this kind of thing, Sophia, the humanoid robot. Um, uh, actually, within the industry, people are apoplectic about Sophia because they think that Sophia is a complete fraud, trying to pretend to be human when it's a long way off for being human and maybe it's people people have been watching too many um movies like ex machina and this is whereas sophia is trying to be human this is a, a human trying to pretend that uh, she's a robot but if you want to understand what ai is uh don't think humanoid robot think code think software programming it's it's essentially that um and as such um it's effectively invisible um and so in the future, Grimshaw's in the future, you won't be surrounded by humanoid robots um, like this, but you'll be surrounded by AI. In fact, a lot of people don't realize that, but we are already surrounded by AI. It's what's finishing our sentences on Gmail. It's what's um, uh, translating in on WeChat. It's what's recognizing our friends on, um, uh, on Facebook. It's what's filtering out our spam and so on. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, it's just that we're not maybe aware of um, um, and in my, my first book, I made this comment, um, it is as though the Earth has been invaded by an invisible, super-intelligent alien species. Um, so how did AI emerge? Actually, the UK has had an incredible um, impact on the, the, the history of computation itself and also on AI. I mentioned Geoffrey Hinton earlier on. He's British. Um, uh, uh, Alan Turing was British. Uh, Charles Babbage, the kind of the, the designer of the first protocomputer, was British. Demis Osabis at DeepMind is British. Um, Stuart Russell, who's written the book on AI, he's British. So it's, a, it's actually a huge amount, surprisingly, um, from 
from the UK, but it's Alan Turing who um, first conceptualized the notion of con con connecting computing to intelligence. Um, I find the term intelligence problematic, but never mind. Um, uh, that was back in the 50s, as we all know from watching the imitation game. Uh, he didn't survive much longer, 50, committed suicide in 54. And this is where um, the, uh, the term AI was coined in 56 for a gathering of the smartest and brightest uh, uh, in the States, um, including this is Marvin Minsky, who's part of MIT Media Lab. Um, and their idea was to solve the basic problems of AI within two years. Um, Actually, it was a complete disaster. There was a, the whole history of AI has been a history of let, letdown, shall we say, of, of, of failed, of too much hype and failed, uh, failed, uh, failing to achieve those those goals. When they met up again, and these are the survivors, including um, John McCarthy, who who coined the term AI. He said, "I had to call it something. I called it AI. Um, um, I, I wasn't very happy with the term, but I had to go and call it something." Well, I don't think it's a great term. First of all. It's not artificial at all. It's synthetic, perhaps. And as soon as you use the word intelligence, you're kind of anthropomorphizing it. Um, I, I, I use terms like learning and, 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 and intelligence and creativity and so on, apply it to AI, and it seems to be wrong. I think personally it's about information processing. Um, um, and that's what it is. But anyway, um, I won't get that too much. So it, when 50 years later, they, the, the survivors, as it were, got back together again, and there was actually nothing to show, very little to show um, in the 50 years. And that's partly because, well, the, the, but by strange coincidence, it was about the same time that deep learning took off. And that's really what's revolutionized everything. So the term AI is has been around since 56 but if you talk about ai in the beginning and talk about ai now it's the same as talking about the first car and it's not something like a tesla there's there's absolutely no comparison um and this guy um jeffrey hinton um was the guy who really made things happen marvin minsky mentioned before he's kind of like the villain in the series right um at the end of his career he was connected with jeffrey epstein dot 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 he also was the person who wrote a book back in the 60s, trashing neural networks, saying they were not going nowhere. Um, and for a long time, they were out of favor. And Jeffrey Hinton, who was uh, obsessed with trying to model AI on the brain, he went to study, after studying at Cambridge, went to Edinburgh to go and do something on working on neuroscience. And he was really convinced the only way to get to AI was by understanding how the brain operates. And there's several others in the same situation. Demis Osabis has also did a PhD on neuroscience. But because of this kind of the dismissal of, of neural networks, whenever he was submitting papers, he had to kind of somehow mask over and, and pretend he wasn't dealing with this world of neural networks. But it was eventually around 2006, that's when, when it really took off, mainly because of a number of different things, but to do with the vast increased computing power and the better algorithms. So this is what we're talking about in deep learning. It's a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of the broader category of AI. Um, think of them like these Russian dolls nested inside each other. Um, but deep learning is what's happening now. And normally when people refer to AI, chat GPT, all this stuff, it's all deep learning. Um, uh, and as I say, it's because of a series of factors that these things could really take off. Um, the main one being just the, the, the vastly improved computing power and better algorithms, but other factors also kind of came into it. And for, for sure, although AI went through what's called a series of winters when funding was cut because it wasn't performing, now it's happening. It's uh, certainly here to stay. Um, and there were a couple of moments, I think, that kind of in the history of AI, which really brought it home to the general public and you know, what was happening. In 1997, Gary Kasparov was, uh, took on Deep Blue, IBM's computer, and um, nobody thought he would lose. One of the greatest chess players of the time, um, but he lost. And he made this, I think, very important kind of comment, which is absolutely true, the question is simply when. We just have to understand that everything that we know how to do, machines will eventually do better than us. And it's, it's, it's happening at different speeds, right? There's some things like chess and go, clearly it's particularly good at already. Um, um, and, but then the really, uh, and that was a comment I made in my book, um, uh, but then the really important one was, um, it was in, in 2016 when they, they, uh, AlphaGo, which is this UK based, um, uh, uh, is produced by DeepMind of London, um, since acquired by Google. And 
they took on Lisa Doll, who was the kind of Gary Kasparov, shall we say, of the world of Go. And the point about this is that Go is, is infinitely more complicated than chess. Even though the moves are quite straightforward, there are more possible moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. So even if you put all the computers of the world together, you would never be able to sort of calculate this. So they had to, had to shift from the expert systems of, of Deep Blue, where they were literally uploading all the information about every single chess match played to a learning system. In other words, to dealing with, with deep learning. Um, and this was an exhibition I, in London re, uh, recently um, commenting on this particular match, which is really important in, in the whole history of AI. Um, and this particular comment after game two, yesterday, after game one, I was surprised, um, but today I am speechless. Um, and the reason why for that were there was a series of moves that happened, which were called slack moves. Everybody thought they were mistakes, they were glitches, they just thought that the computer's not working. But actually, many moves later, we suddenly began to realize they were strategically brilliant. And that's the interesting thing is that we couldn't even follow what this was doing. And this particular move, game 30, move 37 in game two, which is this stone here, which I don't play go, but you don't put it on the fifth line, you only put the fourth or third line, very unusual move, never played before. 100 moves later, these two black stones here linked up with it and it, and it won the game. And this, that's why he was surprised. And so even the commentators at the time just were totally, totally confused by this. And I think I've got a video coming up. Um, these are the Google commentators. I don't know if you, they could probably hear it there, but okay. All they're basically saying is, um, that's an unusual move. Yeah, I thought it was a mistake, but it wasn't a mistake. And I, I think this is the interesting kind of question is that um, that it's just operating a different, a different level. Um, I don't, I, so I don't like, I don't want to call it intelligence, but it's certainly information processing. And those of you who've got dogs know the range of smell and hearing of a dog far exceeds human beings. And this is what's happened. Um, so it's not just simply that it, was, it, it exceeded us in terms of creativity, but you could also say that we just didn't even, couldn't even recognize it. It was beyond the spectrum. It was just operating at a different sort of level. Um, and this is like why people were so shocked by this particular sort of patch. And what's interesting also um, is that this is happening now when they apply this to um, urban planning design, uh, designing, um, urban planning rather. Um, this is a comment by Harvard Hochland, who was the CEO of Spacemaker AI before it was acquired by Autodesk. And he's kind of commenting the same thing, basically, that, that you know, it was coming up with counterintuitive solutions that no architect would have thought about, but actually they were much better, which is kind of disturbing in a sense. Um, so the question then of, of how AI could be used in, um, in architecture, um, this is this is going back to Jeffrey Hinton again. Um, this is recent, about 2012, they had a competition it's called the ImageNet competition, where um, uh, they were trying to see how, how, whether, how quickly you could recognize an image of a bird. Um, and we take this for granted, right? Because we've got our mobile phones, you can facial recognition opens it. But 2012, this was really, really novel. Nobody had done this before. Um, and Jeffrey Hinter came along and showed that deep learning neural networks could do it much, much quicker than anyone else. And that's when people began to realize there's something else happening, and this is the technique we need to follow. But not only that, they then began to realize that actually, if you could go from an image of the bird on the left to a, a, the word bird, the, really, the holy grail was whether you could go the opposite way, whether you could start with the word bird and generate an image of a bird. Um, and they discovered that actually, just by reversing the neural network, you could do that. Um, and this produced what's known as deep dream, um, completely trippy images, um, whereby, some of the information about where these things should be positioned has been lost in the process. Therefore, they're kind of, as they put it, pose invariant. They're all over the place. But you can see this neural network's been trained on what looks like dogs down here. It looks like an oil lamp and, and, and you know, um, serpents and things. Um, and this was, was, was caused a sensation, partly because it's so trippy. The first ever exhibition of AI generated art was based on, on this technique. Um, but the real breakthrough happened when this technique was 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 developed um, called um, generative adversarial networks or GANs, where you get two you get two neural networks, a generator and a discriminator, and the generator is taking random noise, 
producing an image, <clears throat> which the discriminator is kind of judging against the training set and deciding whether or not it's convinced or not. And in that process, the discriminator is training the generator until the generator comes up with something convincing. And that started producing something truly astonishing in terms of the quality of the images. Uh, these were the first faces that were generated using style GANs. There's a whole zoo of different forms of, of GANs at the time. And uh, uh, so suddenly, suddenly we had kind of reached something very special. Um, and, and then I think the first architectural um, version of this was Refik Anadol, who's a media artist based in LA from Turkey. And uh, we had actually in 2019, we proposed to, so I proposed to do the British Pavilion at the Venice Biennale um, with, with Zahadid Architects and with Refik and sponsored by Google, which I would have thought was a kind of dream team. Maybe Grimshaw would be better still, but, uh, but we were not even in the shortlist. That shows how, how people were not aware of this. So Ref, and we were planning to do this, but Refik got on with it anyway, and he just started producing this and fed all the images from the, the, the Zaha buildings into this neural network and started hallucinating um, this as an image. Um, it takes a long time. You've got to produce thousands of images, and it's not so straightforward. Um, you have to have some computational background to do it. So it wasn't easy, and the images coming out were not that great. But nonetheless, this was kind of a, a historically a kind of crucial moment, 2019, when we get, I, th I think, the first GAN generated image um, of a design <coughs> just emerging out of the computer. I mean, Zaha was no longer around. We could still produce something Zaha like. Um, and that was the result, which became the, the image that we put on the front cover. And then people started doing other things. Um, we moved into cycle GANs, which is a kind of where you're working with pairing off different things. So it's not, you're not you know, interpolating within a limited data set, you're actually extrapolating, breeding as it were. Um, <coughs> and this is a work of Paul I've already suggested the next guy you should invite is Daniel Bolajan, who is the mastermind behind this, um, super smart guy. Um, and they, they kind of, they, they, they're suddenly producing something. And this, I think in 2021, was pretty much the state of the art in terms of um, uh, of what you could do. It, it won the Cadia Award, it won a Digital Futures Award, and, and so on. Um, and, and this was the sit. Uh, uh, and, and some of the images, you could, they're always glitchy. Right? They're, you can, everything that comes out, if it's not glitchy, it means they've kind of some kind of post production. But um, uh, they're always glitchy, but they're beginning to sort of approximate um, buildings. And they're got based on a data set of all the work that, that they produced in the office, which is about a thousand different projects. So there's quite a lot to build upon. So this was, a, in, a, in a sense, the, the, the state of the art at a particular time. Um, and we used it on the front cover of the AD, Machine Hallucinations. But then something different happened. Um, and this is um, what we call diffusion models, which is working in a very different process. Um, and it's all coming out of OpenAI, right? So it's all from the same kind of base as ChatGPT. And DALI was not released to the general public to begin with. Um, uh, but was already ca causing a sensation and what it's doing is not it's not imitating things not copying things it's it's searching and synthesizing um from data that's been scraped from the internet so there probably hasn't been a photograph of an astronaut on a horse but it's able to in to interpolate that to synthesize that and get a horse and put what an astronaut would have been like on a horse and that was already causing uh, causing sensations but it wasn't available to the general public i gave a talk at the aa almost identically, the 13th of May last year, and I was talking about this and saying, um, when would this moment happen when Arkek would wake up? And Patrick Schumacher was in the audience, and I didn't know he'd been collaborating with Refik, and they started producing this kind of stuff using DALI, because um, Refik had got access to this. It wasn't, uh, wasn't open to the public at that particular time. And um, so they were kind of producing things at an order of, of magnitude better than, the, than that first image that he produced. Um, and these are just 2D, but they look kind of convincing from a 3D point of view. Um, and after that, of course, Mid Journey appeared, and I, I don't know, this is my stuff, but anyone could do this, right? Um, and and you can you can even you know working for Zaha, you can still produce this kind of kind of work. And I guess so. From that moment on, this is when things really started picking up. I guess July onwards, people started noticing that Mid Journey was producing things and coming up with things that you wouldn't have thought about. I think this is the interesting thing. It's just beyond the range of what we would imagine. I, I think humans are not as, as creative or as imaginative as they think we like to think about. 
Uh, and it's starting as it went through these, the, the goalposts are always changing because they're different sort of models that they go through and they get more and more refined and gradually they get more and more sense of kind of form and, and materiality and so on. And this is the kind of more recent stuff that I would be been producing and I won't go into what I'm doing now, except to say that I always, I would say always when you're using this to always put something into the, into the prompt that acts like the, um, I can put it the, like the, the, the grit in an oyster. You produce, this particular one, I put a, the name of a frog from the Amazon that has a weird pattern on its back and it's a poisonous frog, it doesn't matter, but it, it produces the most astonishing images and things. So, but then there's a whole community of these and you can go on to, Instagram has been the kind of the, 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 the site of choice as it were, where people are displaying these things. And what I find astonishing is that every day, these guys just churning out a new design every day and, and it's it's astonishing what, what can be produced and some of them are getting i think you guys should look out for these in your office right try and find some people like this um this is a, a, a winery in california um and and there's, there's a certain group of i would call them super users who now know how to control this this is a guy called uh, carlos Panon, who's a spanish architect professor in singapore and he uses control net to to, to condition these things and, and anyway there are a few experts coming out who are kind of thinking it. What, so what's happening here, I would just go back. It's, this is not a GAN, this is a diffusion model, but I think what we're discovering is it's kind of operating a bit like a GAN in the sense that human beings, I think are really good discriminators. You know, you can smell a perfume, taste a cocktail instantaneously you can tell whether it's good or not. And those of you who've been reviewing portfolios here, you probably go through them in about 30 seconds, right? Um, but I don't think that we're such good, uh, we're so good at generators. We've got a limited range of imagination. So what's happening is that Mid-Journey, Dali and so on are just basically increasing the range of options. They're kind of becoming a prosthesis to the human imagination. They're producing more options and then we can choose uh, between them. So anyway, this is, as you, as you all know, probably has been causing a sensation. There's a, there was an exhibition in Texas recently about these diffusion models. I'm not quite sure why it's called architecture after AI because AI is not going away, but anyway. But I still, I, I personally think this is, a, this is a, a kind of trap because all it's doing is producing kind of sketches, right? Um, and what's more, the real problem about these sketches is that each one is completely different. So you, when you can't really produce an interior that relates to the exterior, and you can't reproduce a kind of a series of elevations where the east, south, southwest, north elevations all relate to one another. So we need to move beyond that. And I would simply suggest that what's happening now in, in Corp Hoblau is actually taking it to a different level where they're not basing it on images, they're basing it on parameters. And it's getting far more co complex. And as a result, they actually are beginning to be able to match these elevations and also the interior and exterior. So, uh, and strangely also going back and using GANs and many other sort of uh, techniques. So it's not straight diffusion models, um, but I definitely get Daniel Bollinger in because he's, 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 he's the guy who's, who's really churning these things out. So this to my mind is one level of where things potentially could go. It's kind of weird though that a, a small firm in Vienna with a, a principal who's older than, uh, than, than Nick Grimshaw uh, has been investing so much time in this um, because I don't know what happens when he dies, um, but you know, but it's not so easy to do this thing and you need a, some kind of super user to really be able to handle that. Alongside that, I say there are other areas which are, which um, I don't know so much about Space Maker, um, although I was talking to Waterdesk last week, but I do know about uh, XCool partly because Wan Yu He is the CEO of XCool, is one of my doctoral candidates. And what I can say, and I can't show you half the stuff that they're doing, but uh, in three to five years' time, there will be software coming on stream that will completely change the, 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 the way that we operate. Um, in particular, they're trying to sort of find a single platform. So instead of having these discrete operations, I mean, at Zaha's now, you might go from Maya to, to Rhino to uh, BIM to something else, and they're just having it as one platform that's going to go from data to fabrication. So that's going to be one of the kind of the ways that things go forward. They're also um, been testing out different sort of techniques and things and, and entering competitions. They beat MVRDV in a competition recently. And, and I'm not saying that they're the greatest designers, but there's things that are beginning to emerge that are going way beyond what we see in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, with these diffusion platforms. This is a kind of a topological optimization thing to do with wind comfort, whereby they're breaking down these initially rectilinear forms and there's a kind of morphogenetic process and we start getting as it were more kind of frank gary forms appearing um towards the end this is not that sophisticated but still it's still taking it into a kind of different sort of um domain and and 
there's work going on. And half the time, of course, you don't know what's, you can't find out what's going on because they're not allowed to disclose what's going on. Um, but this is the way that it's going for this particular project won an international competition. Um, and then they used AI to go and to reduce the number of, of, of different um, uh, triangles, uh, the, the, the kind of tiling systems on the thing. They got someone from Gary Technologies and reduced it from 1,000 to 500, then they used AI to bring it down to 12. So all sorts of ways it's beginning to sort of um, open up in, in new directions. And then, and this is another competition, that they, where they, this one where they beat MPRDB, I think I'll skip this because it's uh, much time. Alongside that, I'd say there's something else. Um, and I don't know what it is, but my hunch tells me that the GPT system is going to suddenly produce something. You can produce a technology, um, but you don't know how it's going to be used. Um, when the, the mobile phone was, was invented, they thought it was going to be for rich businessmen. But when a rich businessman would, would lend their phone to their daughters who were going out one evening and, and, and say, give us a call when you want me to pick you up, suddenly it changed. So you, you don't know what's happening. And often, What's happening already with these diffusion models is people have been combining it, not only with control net but with grasshopper and they've been doing lots of different inventive things and i think that's opening up in interesting new ways i'm absolutely convinced that the gpt is going to come in somehow even though it's only based on text and radically change these because it writes code that's the point it writes code um i certainly i know that there's a, a my friend lei zheng at zahas who who's runs the, the, the Beijing office, she uses ChatGPT the whole time just to, to write letters to, to the clients and things. And, and or she writes them in, in her very bad English and she says, please tidy that up and you get this perfect letter coming out. So I just think that this is going to have a, a huge impact. Um, so the, the dark side of AI. Um, um, I, my first glimpse of this, I think, was on a boarding a plane in LA, LAX to, to Shanghai and I came on with my boarding pass and um, I, I, I showed it to the flight attendant and she said, I don't need that, just look at this panel. And all of a sudden, uh, it kind of recognizes me, right? And it gives me my seat. And I thought, holy shit, it recognized me from everyone else on this planet. And, and that's when I started thinking, this is a bit terrifying. Um, and I found, found myself in a slightly sort of Elon Musk situation because he's both kind of promoting um, uh, AI in terms of Tesla, in terms of, um, of, of of, of, of uh, SpaceX and um, Neuralink and so on and so on, but warning us that it could be the end of civilization. I think another comment that people have come up with just recently is that we all thought that this is it's actually a Tesla floor but, uh, factory. We all thought it would be blue collar workers who would be the first to go under because you don't have any humans there in the first place. But actually robot, robotic arms are, are still a bit primitive. I mean, it's okay if they're programmed to do things very precisely, but you give them a bunch of bricks and tell them to build a wall They'll, have, they'll really struggle to be able to, to handle that kind of thing. Meanwhile, actually AI has been racing ahead. And now what people are realizing is the white collar workers uh, that are most at risk, um, uh, including frankly, computer scientists. I always thought, oh, when things get bad, we'll all go to computer science, but actually AI is wrote, writing code. So there'd be predictions. We don't need computer scientists very much in the future. Um, I, was, I wrote this thing for Dazeen um, I don't know, about two months ago now, somebody wrote some articles, we haven't, we haven't got to worry about AI. I, I emailed them, what do you mean we haven't got to worry about AI? That's ridiculous. And so they said, okay, um, write something <laughs> you're gonna, gonna, um, uh, uh, about the, the, the risk of this thing. So actually, I used ChatGPT to write up a bit. Um, and uh, ChatGPT is a bit vanilla, it's a bit bland. But if you say, oh, come on, ChatGPT, give us a bit more racy than that, it can make it more exciting, it spices it up, right? So, um, uh, so you end up with these kind of comments. So it's imperative that architects pay attention to AI and its potential to revolutionize architecture, or they risk sleepwalking into oblivion. Now, what was interesting about that article, I got two different sets of responses. Those who are working in AI said, well, that's nothing special. We all knew that. What are you talking about? Whereas those who didn't know about AI, I was so amazed by the kind of pompous comments I got. Like, you know, as one guy said, there's not a single AI on the market that can possibly match my sheer ingenuity and creativity. And you knew that actually that's, that's exactly the problem because that's what happened, right? It went from the beginning to, um, to from, from Gary Kasparov. Nobody thought Gary Kasparov, because no one thought the least at all. And, and, and this is another quote from Jack Ma, who was until recently the CEO of Alibaba, saying, you know, uh, human beings can never create another thing that is smarter and smart than human beings and Elon Musk corrects him and the biggest mistake I see people making is to assume they're smart 
people underestimate the capability of AI. They sort of think it's like a smart, it's a, a smart human, but it's going to be much smarter than the smartest human you will ever know. But the point is you wouldn't even realize it because it's beyond the spectrum in terms of, of what we're, we're doing. So um, anyway, as a result of that, the end of that summer, um, I was writing a book. Um, I should say actually, I initially was commissioned by the RFA Publishing to write a book about this and Ellen Castle. I worked with an AD and commissioned me and, and, I, and I spent three weeks and I came back with this. I said, okay, I've got the title. It's going to be the death of the architect. She said, well, uh, um, I'm not sure our members would like that too much. Could we look at the death of the architect question mark? And <clears throat> so I said, well, I think it should be the death of the architect exclamation mark. Um, anyway, I decided to take it away from RAB Publishing because I think they were going to look over my shoulder and try and intervene too much. And I went to Bloomsbury instead. Um, and I was doing this book and, and then I found myself compromised, like Elon Musk talking both about how good it was, but also how terrifying it was. So eventually I persuaded them to do two books and this is not actually the cover but anyway never mind one with a white cover like an angel about the good side of ai and one with a with a a, 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 a dark cover black cover um, like the devil about the dark side of ai now it's not that ai is 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 evil or anything right if you can't think you can't have any evil intentions right it's just it's just a machine but the problem with ai is precisely it is so capable I think we're all beginning to realize it right now. And that is the, the danger of AI itself. I, I was going to put this book off until you know, I've written a few nice books about AI, but now it seems that somehow I should I should write, write about it. But it's not just AI. Right? I think that the whole, to my mind, I mean, I'm an I'm a ARB licensed architect in the UK. I, I qualified over here. I just see the profession being undermined in all sorts of ways. I mean, uh, we're no longer in charge, right? The model from Alberti about the architect being in charge <coughs> Most contracts, and I don't know about Grimshaw, most contracts in the UK are already designed build where you're working for a, for a developer. So I think the profession is already struggling and I think AI is just gonna make, make it worse. So that's that's my position. So I'm gonna finish off with, um, with, with, a, with 10 predictions about the future of AI. Um, 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 some of them a bit late, um, <laughs> but anyway, just to sort of co comment on, on where I kind of see it going. Um, first of all, and this is kind of obvious in some senses um, that it's now a, it's like it's prosthesis to the human imagination. We become cyborgs. Um, we, you know, this is Elon Musk talking about how we become superhuman because we've got this machine extension of ourselves, and so on and so on and so on. That's fairly obvious that we're able to do far more. Um, um, but that also has an implication because in, uh, in terms of the way that we use it and, and, and in employment, I'll just talk about that in a moment. Um, um, these two buildings will be controlled, will become intelligent, cities will be controlled by AI. They're kind of similar, so I just lump them together. Um, I think that, you know, well, you know, what will the future city look like? Um, is it going to look like some, like this, like something out of the Jetsons? I doubt it. I, I think the future city, personally, is going to look pretty much like the city of today. This is LA, where I'm based. Um, we'll see a few new buildings um, being built, of course, of course. But the main changes we're going to get, and it's going to the existing building is going to be retrofitted um, with 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 latest technology, um, and we're going to be using um, uh, AI to control traffic. In fact, in certain cities in China, they're already doing that. So I think the digital twin will come in, both to monitor the, the performance of a building and also to solve traffic problems. Um, that seemed to be quite obvious. And when I produced this AD in 2009, I think it was um, Digital Cities, it was interesting how architects got it completely wrong. Um, so Patrick Schumacher, this was the first time he started talking about parametricism, and he was predicting that all these, these, these parametric cities everywhere, of course, we haven't had any yet. Um, in fact, all architects were talking about four. Um, and it, it, the, the one article that was completely spot on was an article by um, uh, uh, Ben Bratton, uh, who's, who is called iPhone City. He was talking about how the iPhone has completely changed how we navigate and understand cities, and it's about information. And I think that's absolutely um, uh, 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 crucial. So you get Mario Carpo, who writes a lot of nonsense at the department, about a lot of nonsense about what's the style going to be of, 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 let's say, big data. And he read somewhere that big data is messy and therefore we're going to have messy architecture. It's not about form, it's about information. And if you think about an Uber car, does the Uber car look different to an ordinary car? No, because it is an ordinary car. It's the way that the information has been processed that makes it so radically different. So I think the notion of information, informational cities, the way we should think about the future of our cities, not in terms of something out of, out of the Jetsons and so on. 
this one is kind of obvious in some senses, um, uh, but I just I think it's kind of interesting in some way because we still cling to some stupid things like passports, which I, I don't know, I was in Barcelona recently, and thanks to my compatriots who voted for Brexit, um, I found myself in the non-EU line, right? And it took an hour to get through this. And I just thought this is ridiculous. Um, I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm in a, I've subscribed to some system in the States. I go in, when I enter the States, I, I don't even show my passport, I just show my face and it recognizes me and I go through in three seconds, you know? So why on earth do we have passports? Why are we stamping passports? All these things could, could very well go, although there is a kind of like a, a kind of residue. People like to keep to old systems. Uh, so maybe it won't happen as soon as it should. Clients will start to insist their, that their architects use AI. This is actually a comment from a space maker um, from this discussion. Uh, uh, I thought that was kind of interesting. Why would, why would developers want architects to use um, AI? Well, firstly, I think it's going to optimize their, um, the profit the, 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 uh, in terms of what they can get out of a site. Um, secondly, we make mistakes. Seldom does AI, AI make mistakes. It's one way of checking you don't make mistakes. It's a bit like spell check. It sounds mundane, but I think that's what law AI is going to be about. It's going to be making sure we don't make straightforward mistakes, but there may well be other reasons too. Professional indemnity insurance will go up for those not using AI. Um, this is a scary one, right? Um, so Toby Walsh is actually also from the UK. He's now in Australia, he's a computer scientist. He wrote a book called Machines That Think, which is a stupid title, but machines don't think. But he makes this one interesting prediction, which I think is very, it's, it's kind of illuminating. Basically, he says we're going to be banned from driving. And the, his way of thinking is this, you know, we'll get, you know, all these kind of self-driving Ubers and things. And we're going out for a drink at night in the evening and we think, okay, well, let's just go and take a self-driving Uber or whatever it was. It'll be very convenient and we'll start doing that. And as we're doing that more and more, so our own driving skills will go down slightly until it gets to a certain point where actually um, we, we, it gets more expensive to be a human driver because you'll be, you'll, you have to pay a higher insurance premium because you're, even though um, Google cars and whatever it is are not perfect now, they will be. Um, and humans will always be distracted. They will be checking their phones and whatever it is. So premiums will go up and eventually, according to Toby Walsh, we'll, 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 um, we'll be banned from driving. We're just bad drivers. Um, and he makes this interesting comment, we won't even, will not even notice or care. I mean, that's a kind of amusing one. So the question is, how does that relate to, to architecture? Um, this one is kind of, is also interesting because you, with, there's not much to see it for this moment, but I know it's going on. AI will be able to generate outcomes conforming to all constraints. And I would simply, mentioned this is a very primitive model um, coming out from x cool it's going to be really the way that things operate in the future whereby you everything is integrated in, and, and when this thing is generating these forms and you can change what it looks like and facades and whatever it is it's all conforming toward towards uh, 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 building regulations um, local codes and it's calculating things in terms of the structure and in terms of the, the performance the environmental performance dot 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 and keeping a track of cost now this is a really primitive system it's very modular and it's basic and so on but in three to five years time we're gonna have a system where it's going to be tracking everything and and coming up with things so everything's going to be conforming in, in some way um uh 80 of architects could lose their jobs this is again a bit, a bit startling but like the point is this is that this was a study that was done in 2013 by these two scholars from oxford where they were looking at um which jobs were most susceptible um to ai and they went through and there's a there's some 700 jobs right and apparently if you're a recreational therapist, you're pretty safe. Um, um, and you get down, and architects um, uh, are, uh, are not too bad, 80, 80 second. It seems that uh, the, maybe the, the architectural managers will be a bit, uh, will do a bit better, they'll keep their jobs longer, but basically architects should be okay. And when we get down to like 702, well, they're no telemarketeers anymore, they will disappear. So that sounds good, right? We're in the top 10%, you know, we're not gonna be replaced, but actually they're making a complete mistake here because what they're doing is assuming it's just human beings versus AI. Whereas actually what it is, is human beings plus AI with this kind of prosthesis versus those without AI. Um, and according to Wan Yu, and who knows whether this is correct or indeed when it might be correct or not. She reckons that one person with AI can achieve as much as five people without, without AI. Now, oh, clearly that's only a generalization and there are many different tasks in the architectural, you know, in the office that are, operate different sort of ways, but that would seem to suggest that possibly up to 80% could, 
could become redundant. Um, who knows? Um, uh, <coughs> licensing might become a thing of the past. I don't know. I've got this thing about AI, RIBA and AIA. AI, AI. I think that's so stuffy, even though I gave a talk to AIA last week. Um, but you know, what's interesting about this is X Cooler. So I should mention X Cool. Uh, uh, Wan Yu Her is used to work for ONA. X Cool means X Cool House. And 2016, she set up this company in Shenzhen. They're the world leaders. I would also say, however, they're, what they're doing is based on data for Chinese buildings. And I don't think XCool is going to be available in the West for some time. Anyway, what's interesting about what they're doing, they're being asked to use AI to um, judge competitions. Now, that's interesting because it, assumed, it means that basically they could also enter competitions, which they're doing already, and they're beating NBRDV and Stahita, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but then it becomes, and you think, well, okay, if they're judging competitions, um, then you could imagine in the end, in the future, you will be judging planning permissions and things using AI. I mean, the moment we kind of go along and pompously say, well, I'm an architect, because look, I've got the certificate, and so look, I should know what I'm doing. Um, I think in the future, they'll base it on the proposal and on the submission. They don't care if you're an architect or not. Um, that's my sort of view. And what's more, if you've got a system that's already producing something conforming to these constraints, then you don't need to have it checked in the first place because it's already performing. That would seem to suggest that maybe we don't need to have this whole thing about licensing. And certainly there are people around, these are two British uh, uh, academics who wrote a book some time ago called The Future of the Professions. They don't really talk about AI so much. They talk about automation. And they're saying, well, the problem about the professions is they're just based on this kind of gentleman's agreement that architects will police the world of architecture and, and so on and so on and so on. But actually, when it comes to it, it's going to be there can be other factors that are going to go, go and squeeze out that kind of logic. Um, we are on the brink of a, a period of fundamental and irreversible change. Technology will be the main driver of the change. And in the long run, we will neither need nor want professionals to work in the way they, they did in the 20th century and before. And I think the important thing is they're talking about profits. It basically, in the end, it's going to be about it's going to be about about financial kind of issues. And I can see. I, I, I guess, I, I, the, because we can now do things much more easily, people will be undercutting others. It'll be vicious. There'll be, and, and, and the, the profits to be made from architecture, I think are gonna go, go down because it's gonna be easier to do these things and so on and so on. Anyway, their view is that we, we, don't, we don't need that. Um, cost will force things out. However, I think that there is, and maybe this could apply to Grimshaw, there is actually another sector of the market where it doesn't matter, right? If you were to say that, that Zaha is like Prada or Gucci, I mean, you don't buy a Gucci bag or a Prada bag to save money. You do it for the opposite reason. You want to show you don't care about money. So I think that the architects still will have a role in the future um, and it'd be like a personal trainer or something. You, you will, you know, you'll boast about it and things. Um, so I still think that there'll be, there'll be a scope for the, for the architects. Um, this, uh, um, uh, one second. This is about the licensing architect. Yeah, this is also ChatGPT telling us that, um, that maybe we don't need to, to have licensing might not be a, might not be important in the future. So maybe I could finish off um, with a final sort of comment about about um, uh, about. So this is all very convenient, right? And we can do things, amazing thing. I think a, a one person office could probably you know submit a proposal in for a competition for an urban planning thing that otherwise would be impossible. It's amazing what we can do at the moment within our existing conditions, um, but things are gonna, gonna change, I think, eventually. And um, it'll, of course, be very convenient when you're able to get AI to design a building completely autonomously. And, and you know, I think that some of the, the, the question I was showing you this thing about planning, how it was coming up with planning proposals, there are aspects of architecture I always think are very kind of functional and strategic, right? And they're logical, a bit like a game of Go or chess. And you can see that AI is very good at that. But the kind of aesthetics, shall we say, is a bit more complicated. But I don't think it's going to be so long before AI is going to, just as it knows what books you want on Amazon, what music you like on Spotify, it'll know, it'll track your tastes and things and be able to also deal with things, uh, that with, with the, the aesthetics of things. So. The fact that AI will be able to design a building completely autonomously is probably bad news um, for architects. Um, so I think this is, these are the two images I think are really important to think about in terms of, of, uh, of, of um, AI. You know, what, once you've got a self-driving car, do you need a, you need a driver? Um, does that not apply to architecture? And Lisa Dole, kind of interesting because, you know, 
nobody expected him to lose um, in 2016. By 2019, he'd given up the game of Go, uh, the, the basis that AI was an entity that could not be defeated. Um, so let me just, uh, this is my final conclusion. Um, what architects need to design right now is not another building, but the very future of their profession. And I think if we can use our imagination to imagine those possibilities, and I think actually there are possibilities in the metaverse that I haven't mentioned that you possible areas we could sort of in, look at, but we need to be aware of this, and not be ostriches with our heads in the sand because the world is changing and it's changing very, very rapidly. Just as an, as an educator, I, I, um, one of the, the challenges, I mean, the real problems for educators, right? Because if they're only gonna be, I don't know, 20% of the architects, so they'll be 20% of the students. And if we can uh, use these tools, do we need five years to study architecture? Probably not. So I could see education really coming to a crunch. And the other problem really is, who is gonna teach this stuff? I mean, you know, it's, it's how could one professor anywhere be dealing with a world that is changing on a daily basis? So what we do at Digital Futures is a platform that I set up a few years ago, is that we offer this platform where we try and get the five or six best people in the world to come and talk about, give, give tutorials. Um, and we had a series of eight, eight of these just recently. Um, and even by the end of the eight, it was almost like, you know, it, the, the, we had to start again because they're all out of date. Um, it's like painting the fourth bridge. You, you finish it, but then you've got to start it again in some ways. So it's almost like you have to have a global classroom. The only way you can operate is, is, is in that kind of space where you bring in the top people in the world to operate. Anyway, there is this thing which you, you might be interested in or not, which is on, this is the, the, the Digital Futures Library at the bottom there, where we have a series of these tutorials about how do you, starting from the elementary to the, the more complicated, how do you work to 2D to 3D, how you, and so on and so on. So that's, I think, what's where, where we need to sort of kind of go in, in, the, in, the, in the future. So um, uh, I, would, I would, so just kind of sum up then, you know, the, the world is changing very, very rapidly. Maybe one thing I didn't mention was the, the, the principle of Moore's law. This was a kind of comment made by an industrialist, George Moore in the 60s, who basically noticed that every year, the number of, of transistors on a circuit board would double, but the cost would come down by half, which is a kind of exponential sort of increase. So you're going not one, two, three, four, but one, two, four, eight, um, and 16 and so on. Um, and that's been applied by Ray Kurzweil to technology as a whole, which probably expa explains why things seem to be speeding up. And recently, they said we're going fast, even the Moore's law. So it's a world which it is changing incredibly rapidly. Things are coming out that we were not able to understand. Uh, all I would say is that you know, I don't know what the solution is, but I think the important thing is to is to be a kind of aware of the problem. I think once you're aware of a problem, it's not a problem by which you are trapped but it's a problem that you can begin to deal with. And I think it's important for all architects to, to pay attention to that. And, and if, if, I, if this is slightly exaggerated on certain, I don't know, but if 80% of architects go unemployed, who knows? But I think the point is to, you need to exaggerate things to get the message across for people to pay attention because otherwise we can have a, a profession that's been dominated by these people who know nothing about AI, who are completely confident that they're not gonna be displaced by AI. One thing we know for sure, is that no one can predict that the world in the future is going to be the same as it is today. Um, I don't know. I was a student in Cambridge. When I look back on those days, you know, um, I would uh, I would I'd go on a trip somewhere. I'd go to SDA travel and I'd queue up and I'd go and talk to a travel agent. And, uh, they would she'd fix me up a, a flight and the next day she'd put the ticket in the, in the mail and I'd get it and then I'd I'd, I'd go to a, a camera shop. I'd buy these reels of film and I would. I'd take them with me. Then when I came back, I would go and I get them processed and so on. None of those things operate. You don't send tickets by mail anymore. Um, you don't process your films anymore. Most camera shops have gone out of business because because uh, because your phones are perfectly good at taking taking photographs. And you you can't assume that the world in the future is going to be the same as the world in the past. Um, anyway. So I hope that was, some people hate this, right? Some people really hate it. And some people have got this kind of Blade Runner dystopian world. They love it. They love it. <laughs> so I don't know. Well, my apologies to the, the, the former group, but uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation, Neil. Um, if anyone has questions online, please post them in. 
the chat or, or I see my laptop one off. So maybe it's better to raise your hand and speak up. Uh, maybe someone uh, who is present and has a question. We have one. Um, yeah, sure. So what are you saying about, one thing is that profession as an architect in terms of the tools that may affect, but also was mentioned about cities and built not changing that much because it's retrofitting. And I wonder if actually that would be affected as well, because if certain jobs uh, change or evolve, for example, with COVID, that the way we uh, relate with the city change, it may affect actually how the city behaves because of we as humans. We don't do certain journeys or yeah no I, 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 of course so it's basically catching up not only with the tool but also how the interactions with cities may change yeah um no I, of course but i i just think that the the, the signs are already there that the, yeah. the, 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 i don't i mean there's this it's, i mentioned this there's this company in uh, uh, um in china called city brain um and the only evidence i've got is their own so maybe I, it shouldn't be it's not be trusted but i think that just in terms of kind of coordinating traffic that makes a lot of sense but in my book i, I kind of used a chapter on on kind of brain city and how we should understand the city in terms of, of information processes now and and try and see it how it's kind of it's operating in a different sort of way but um i mean there are many other factors as well and, and i don't want to limit it to ai of course um but there are many other factors um, yeah Can I can I ask a question? I'm online. Hi, Neil. This Hi. is Juan, Juan in New York. How are you? Um, hey, fascinating. I really like <laughs> <laughs> well, I th I think you might have been at Nottingham University when I was. Yes, a student. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, fascinating talk, and I can't help. I mean, I agree with change is the only constant apart from death and taxes, um, and it seems to me, and I could be wrong that. We've been undergoing a sort of digital revolution since I was at university when we were playing around with blocks in in Apple. I forget the Apple program, and then um, you know arriving at Grimshaw where everybody had a computer, there were no drawing boards, was kind of shocking already in 1996. And doing basic 3D modeling that took forever, and getting a render was like amazing. Um, to now. The, the new software is generating many, many options and images and photorealistic or whatever your style is to show clients who demand more and more. The, the industry, as the tools get better and faster, demands more options, more optimization, um, less total project cost, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm just curious, listening to you and not being an expert, but thinking about AI, how in a sense, it's just more of that. No, the the it's a tool. It's going to get better and more capable. The industry will demand more. We will, as a society, optimize construction industry using this tool. Um, we'll be able to each of us produce more, as you said. Um, hopefully, we'll address climate change with our <laughs> with our industry and and biodiversity and everything else that we need to if we're going to survive. Um, but I I don't. I don't see a threat. I, I see it more as an opportunity for this progress um, to become real faster. Am I am I being Pollyanna-ish? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I think the difference between this tool um, and those other tools is the fact that this is a tool that learns. I mean, there's a as a uh, his name, Martin Ford gives a talk where he says, "Well, of course, in the past we've had these moments when people have been displayed." Well, Horses were kicked well, as soon as a car was invented. Horses became redundant, right? But, 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 but cars don't learn. These things are learning, and, and the kind of pace at which it's learning is is uh, is is really speeding up. Um, so I think we're in a very novel situation. Um, so it's not quite the same as that. Um, uh, and I do. I I personally take the view, and I'm not an economist, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to be undercutting, undercutting, undercutting. That's going to make it very difficult. I mean, to begin with, we'll maintain our fees and so on but i think that's going to go fairly soon so i i i mean it's it's it it's it is it it will be good in the short term no question it'll we can do much more it'll speed things up we don't have to render all this stuff but i just think longer term 
there must be some problems down the line. I, 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 we had a discussion uh, with um, um, uh, uh, with Patrick Schumacher, and he was convinced, oh, no, it's going to be a problem. We're going to have actually got much more work that we need right now in the metaverse and so on. Um, uh, I don't think you can be confident about that. Um, so uh, I just think we need to we need to get wise to this and exploit its possibilities so we can use it for our advantage rather than, than have people taking over from us. I mean, just one thing I do think is kind of, would be kind of interesting is, is that um, I, you know, what's happening is these, these silos are breaking down that I can design fashion now. Uh, it looks pretty convincing to me anyway. Well, that means fashion designers can design architecture. So all these things are breaking down. I think one thing that we could actually get into, uh, this came out of discussion with Autodesk, was that, was that we, we, we could and should become developers because developing will not be such a mystery anymore. I mean, you can just go these days and go to chat GPT and say, how do I start up a developer group? And, and I think the safeguards, the checks that you're going to get from AI are going to keep you fairly sort of safe. So I think we have to seize this moment and use it to our advantage. And that would be one area I think architects could do, because we're always going to pay much less than developers, right? And, uh, I, I, I suspect there are opportunities out there, but we've got to be, we've got to be critical about these things and not just uh, uh, base it on our own kind of uh, pompous sense of how important we are as architects. I, think. I don't know. No, that's right. I mean, I agree with you. The um, Being aware of it and, and embracing it and kind of using it and going with the flow no adapting the whole industry will adapt the developers will also be threatened in some of you know their the staff that they need will be less i think hopefully it becomes a way to optimize an industry that is way inefficient <laughs> um, compared to many other industries and you think of a factory building cars is now a handful of humans controlling the robots with the software so and and maybe that will even optimize further but we're so far from that right now in the construction yeah. where every building is a prototype um but i take your point about eyes wide open <laughs> yeah yeah um so i guess that's one like what i had in mind uh mainly microsoft was so uh, I guess I'll bring the example of the GPS, for example, the Google Maps, right? So, you know, before Google Maps, people were able to kind of orient themselves in the city quite easily. Now, like you ask someone, where's North? And like they kind of look at themselves, you know? So like, I, I guess my question goes towards there. Uh, I, I am very much an AI advocate. I teach that to, to my students. And I very much see though that, for example, the ChatGPT, right? So students nowadays writing their dissertations, for example, using ChatGPT. And I kind of miss the point that personally, I very much feel that you're missing kind of the learning curve there. Sure, might not be needed after some point if AI kind of uh, kind of covers all that for us. But for me, I personally very much like, and mostly, honestly, I'm not asking for your opinion here. Like, yeah, that learning curve on the human side, right? How, how do we learn even writing code? I'm a coder, like uh, looking into this millions of pages of documentation. You said, like, yeah, it's a hassle, but that's exactly what kind of makes me the developer that I am, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, being able to kind of bring all this knowledge and actually find the relevant parts and actually reuse them after a while. So yeah, I guess like that is a bit of the, yeah, what I'm questioning about all this. Yeah, well, I mean, firstly, <clears throat> I, I'm based in LA, right? And it's, it's having, iPhones and things just completely transform things. I mean, first of all, most streets in LA go from like from one to ten thousand, right? And, it, and the, you can be the same street, but you can be like sixty miles away from it, right? So it is helpful to know exactly where it are. Where it is. Secondly, before there were certain areas of, of LA you couldn't get a taxi because they weren't taxis. Now you can get an Uber or a Lyft pretty easily. So, but the, I think the question about, it, it's an interesting thing because they, they, I mean, I also got my, my students are, are using this the whole time. They're, they're producing stuff with it and they're, they're generating text. They're, they're, they're getting a sense, it's easier to go read it out and they've got the images. They're all producing this kind of stuff. And there was a case recently in, in, in New York where they banned chat GPT from, from classes. And you think, well, what's the, what's the point of that? I mean, first of all, you, you, you I mean, They'll be able to. You can even. I know there's a program there you can detect whether it's from from whether it's to be generated by ChatGPT. But there's also another program that can confuse you. So I mean, you will never be able to fully detect that thing. But it's also kind of pointless. You think about it. Wasn't how long ago was it when we when there was discussion about banning calculators in a maths exam? You know, 
we, I mean, to my mind, the question is, well, once you've got calculators, do you need to do, do math the log division, you know? Um, which then the, the question is, well, what do you need to study as an architect when, when, when you've got all these things? Do you need to learn rendering these days? Or, you know, all these kind of questions. So I personally think that we, we there's no going back to the past and we need to sort of try and engage with these things. And I, I'm sure there's going to be some, some, some slimming down and trimming in certain sort of areas. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's, it's easy when you come from a generation where you had to I mean, you know, <laughs> I was, I was, we, had, we had parallel motions when we were in, uh, in, in, in Cambridge and uh, studying, which is ridiculous. They banned, they banned computers from the studio, um, which kind of meant that there was a whole generation of graduates went out and were unemployable. So that was the only effect of it. But when you think about that, I mean, one of the problems, I think, with, with parallel motions is, is, I mean, take something like the Sydney Opera House, where you kind of, the problem was that your Nutson does his sketch, but the engineers don't know what he's sketching, right? So they had to break it down to a section of, of spheres and so on. So, you know, I think there are all sorts of benefits from being able to track these things and, and computationally sort of follow them and so on. So I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not nostalgic about the past. I mean, I thought it was a ridiculous time, you know, <laughs> that we had to live through. Um, but I don't know, it's, it, and I also think that, you know, um, there's also a comment, I don't know. I always think Prince Charles is so I mean, King Charles. Sorry, you know, he's kind of like, but he used to come up with these comments like, "Oh, these you know these students today, they're all this Beavis and Butter generation. They can't spell. They can't add up." You know, the point is he wasn't able to recognize what they could do. You don't need to spell when you've got spell check. You don't need to add up when you've got calculus. But the new generation are kind of doing multitasking and things, and they're inventively doing certain things. And that's what I think is going to happen with this, this world of AI. You're going to get these people combining these different softwares in radical new ways. I mean, it's already happening already. And that's why I'm saying I'm not so sure that, that ChatGPT is not going to be part of that, that future, because I, who knows how people can combine things. Um, so. I mean, I think your students have probably got the answer. I don't know what they say, but uh, uh, I guess I guess they, they very much utilize it in terms of the ease of use. Honestly, right? Because like yeah, like for us, writing a dissertation was a three month period, and now for them it's like let's let's put another iteration in next week. You know, <laughs> uh, in that front, honestly though, like what I'm keeping out of this, it's mostly that kind of also the, the learning of us as kind of yeah, but the, also that same thing, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, we used to learn math in order for us to come here and kind of understand the geometrical structures. Maybe that's useful now, and we need to all go down the prompt engineering. I don't know. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 you know, I was uh, when I was finished at Cambridge, I was a translator. I translated Alberti from Latin into English, right? And a colleague of mine who was at Emmanuel College with me, he set up the world's biggest translation process for firm, right? And he sold it last year because he could see that Google Translate was going to rule out the whole of translation. So, you know, we've got to be aware of these things. And, um, yeah. I guess on that note, you know, and similar, I think, like I read an article uh, by Ted Chang, who's one of, you know, he's the New York Times contributor, saying we need to find the right metaphor to understand how this is going to impact us. And he kind of says AI is going to be like the management consultant, you know, the, the person who comes into your office and is like, well, what do you actually do here? <laughs> and then starts to uh, optimize towards savings, like you're saying. Like AI is going to push every firm to maximize profits, cut uh, overhead, et cetera. And it ends up prompting the question, like what is it you actually do here? And I think architects, like you said, are gonna have to figure out how to answer this question because it becomes like, well, what is the value that we offer? And how do we convince clients to continue to use our services? And already, like a lot of the value we offer has been like uh, given to consultants, right? Structural engineers and so on and so forth. So I guess like a, a skeptical view would be like, well, if you reduce architecture to the production of these computer generated images, you might get better at making the images, but ultimately we're here to make physical things. And so we need to translate these 2D images of hypothetical spaces into real three-dimensional spaces. And I guess I'm curious to hear your view on that link, because I think the ability to create images has been getting faster and faster and easier and easier for decades, right? Rendering is getting faster. We can model things that we can't even understand how to build. At some point, somebody has to figure out how to build it. So I guess my view, my, I think that is going to be where we end up providing value. But I'm curious to hear where you think. Uh like ultimately, like the, the dollies and the mid journeys are going to get better and better. And fashion designers are going to come and try and say, "Oh, I've made an AI-generated model of a building. I'm an architect now." 
But I feel like what makes our profession distinct is that we, we deal with the making things real. So curious to hear how yeah, you no, think this I mean, I, in that. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, the point of AI is immaterial. It, it's, it has, it's challenging to deal with the three dimensional materiality, but those things are coming in for sure. I didn't, you, I was, I, when you were talking, I was thinking actually this, that Steve Wozniak asked um, uh, Steve Jobs that same question. You know, that I'm a coder, whatever I do this, what do you do, right? You don't make things, you don't whatever. And his response was, uh, he said, well, I'm like a conductor of an orchestra. And I think this is really what architects are in some senses, because we're not really specialists in structural engineering or uh, at anything in particular, but we get that overview. So I, I, I guess a kind of curator or a kind of, a, of an orchestra or something like that could be the way forward. But I think we need to take charge of it. That would be my view. I mean, just sitting back and waiting for, for commissions and so on, or wait, waiting for development. To, I think we, this, is a, this is why I would say, rather than saying, oh my God, oh my God, seize the opportunities. Um, and I don't know if I'm talking nonsense when I'm saying that architects should become developers, but I don't think it's that, that far away. And why are we waiting for them anyway? Um, I mean, the, the article in, 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 in question says that basically, like the personal computing revolution increased the productivity of society, right? Gross domestic product of the planet has increased significantly. Yeah. But in the Western world, the average wage and net worth of the people who are working has not changed. Yeah. So the value that's being increased is going to the people who have capital, yeah. which of course in this case is the developers. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, who's going to develop from all of these improvements? And the current way of working is people who are making the projects, the developers, right? They, yeah. They're the ones yeah. who ultimately yeah. are, are providing I think, service. I, I think in the end, there's a big kind of social, political, economic question that needs to be addressed because um, I mean, because actually, you know, if you, it's like, you know, you give up architecture to go to something else, you're almost jumping from one lifeboat into another because they're all going to sink at some point. And I think the real problem, I don't know if, you, if you're actually from Canada or from the States, but, but I mean, the States has got a huge problem because, you know, it does, can't deal with, you know, minimal wages or, or, or even any kind of social structure. Um, I think Europe is in a much better situation position from that point of view, but it's going to really hit the States. And there, there is huge disparity obviously in, yeah. in, um, right now, especially in California places. So I think we're going to have to introduce some social controls to make sure that we, that some people don't fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. No, it's, it's yeah. No, just to get your opinion, it's not related to architecture, but just artificial intelligence or even AGI in general, what makes us different as humans? You know, is it, is it feelings? Is it years and millions of years of evolution. I mean, I want to know what you think. Like, what's your yeah. Um, I mean, people sort of say, I put so many, so many feelings and emotions into my design. It's going to be better. I mean, when you said forget your feelings and emotions, it doesn't make it better. But I think that I think that I think the problem right now is that we are comparing AI to us from our position, right? And we're saying it's not, it doesn't, it can't think like us. It can't, it's not sentient. It hasn't got this until it's going to do those things. It's never going to be as good as us. I think if we were to take the opposite perspective and say, okay, so these technologies process information incredibly efficiently. We, we don't try and compete with a calculator, right? That does it better than us, but this is a learning version of that, you know? And if we sort of try and put it from that perspective, I would say that we are pretty inferior processing information compared to, to what AI can do. You know, we need to, to recognize that. Um, so I, I think we've got to stop being, you know, I think there's, there's something I wrote about once, is that we need to have a second Copernican revolution. The, the first Copernican revolution over the universe doesn't go around the, the earth, the earth is going around the sun and so on. We've got to realize that we're not sent the center of things. We've got to step back and recognize that and uh, accept that. So, um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> Humans are very, very arrogant sometimes. I don't know, what do you think? I mean, I think our diversity is very special. With algorithms, for example, you can scrap something and write it from scratch, right? Yeah. You can't do that completely. You're the result of, if we do something a certain way, it's because of, it's because of millions of years of evolution of patterns that makes us do something a certain way. And I think that's very special when it comes to humans. And by feelings, I meant like the, like how Damasio looks at feelings. Uh -huh. you know, do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think 
I, I didn't, you know, you know I, I know Damasio quite well because he was, I was teaching at USC. Um, but you should look at Anil Seth. You want to take a neuroscientist, and we were talking about this before. He is, he's in the University of Sussex. He's got the most incredible TED talk. Um, Anil has got a, he's his father's Indian, A N I L, is S E T H. And he's got like 14 million hits on his, on, his, on his TED talk. And you're going to understand why when you hear it. And he makes Damasio look a bit old fashioned, frankly. And uh, so he, his view is that uh, Daniel Seth's view is that we hallucinate our reality. And it's absolutely mind blowing. We also had a series of, of discussions with neuroscientists on, on digital futures. Those guys are wacky. They're completely crazy. You know, it's kind of it's. So there is a new way of thinking. I, I find I find Damasio a little bit old fashioned personally. You know, um, you know who cares about feelings and things? I don't know. He, he's he's certainly people in the in neuroscience are a bit, a bit skeptical. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice guy though. Um, and he loves architecture. He used to live in a in a Mies van der Rohe building in Chicago. And, uh, yeah. Let me keep an eye on time. Uh, we have more questions. Yeah. Go for all more questions. There's one online. Is there one online? Oh, there's, there's, oh, there's, there's something in the chat. I admit, there's a whole thing in the chat here. Oh, Karen in Shenzhen. OK. Um. Hey, yes, that's a question from me. Um. Hi. Because um hi yeah um I'm currently in Shenzhen so um it's nice to hear like um AI is being developed also quite a lot in Shenzhen city um yeah it, it's just like something also quite um you know new for example um Shenzhen city is sort of um trying to push um for official recognition for um uh to replace the ticket machine start from uh, metro but you can also see you know airports and then um high speed rail station and then today even i can you know if i get a coke i can pay by my face <laughs> so it's um yeah it's happening uh but uh i don't know my feeling is really um is that safe uh what about the future like if um this um, gets being used, you know, widely. Um, would that be a sort of um, security issues, um, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, so I, I'm a professor in Tongji, so I kind of follow what's going on in China. I'm <laughs> well aware you guys can buy things in a shop. And, uh, I, I, you know, there are going to be challenges and things, but I think that's the future. I and mean, I certainly think passports are so stupid. That's what I would say. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, you, I, I, Actually, there's an inter very interesting kind of book that's comparing um, uh, by Kai Fu Li, comparing um, uh, Shenzhen to, to Silicon Valley and, and which one is going to be the better one. And, and he, Kai Fu Li, reckons that, that, that Shenzhen is going to be the leader. And I, what's what what is interesting right now, of course, is this big kind of battle going on between the states and China and this chip act where the U.S. won't sell chips to China. It's going to be. China's going to be, be up right up there. And, and just to kind of comment you're probably aware of, because everyone in China knows about that AlphaGo match, right? Uh, President Xi made this kind of comment um, right after it, that, the, that China would want to be the head of, 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 of AI by the year 2030. And it's getting pretty close to that. But I, I would also say that I think everyone in China was taken surprised by open AI. Um, and uh, that's that's a challenge to go overcome at the moment. But you know, I, I, I think that China's going to be right up there. I, I know how hard you guys work and uh, how intelligent you are. So um, China's going to be going to be, I mean, and just to say that, you know, uh, uh, Tongji, where I teach, is now number 12 in the world for, 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 um, for architecture. And some of the old schools are dropping down and these new Chinese schools, Xinhua and so on, are becoming much more prominent. So yeah, maybe China's the future. I don't know. Although it's a bit scary when everyone knows what you're doing, right? That's the, that's the problem. Um, yeah. there's, there's another one here, uh, Sun Zhenji. Um, Oh, you can't see anything. Okay. Thanks for the amazing talk. Quick question regarding the database information NEI is trained on. What are your thoughts on certain biases for architecture? How can we extend the database it's training on? Um, so first of all, bias, the problem of bias is, is a human problem. AI gets its bias from humans. But this is actually 
you've got to get Daniel Bolojan in because what he's doing is saying that already in those platforms, there are biases. You know, Mid Journey and Dali have got these static biases. You need to replace them with the biases of your office you know, and take charge of that. So you've got to basically be kind of um, uh, constructing your own database, which is not so straightforward. But, uh, um, so just to see if there's any other one, the question up here, I think that might be the, oh no, okay. Have you recorded it? I hope so too. Uh, Oh, the question about sound. Okay, well, um, uh, thank you so much. Like, super, super interesting. Uh, it's to be continued, but I, I would just say that that if you do want to find out more about it, that this digital futures thing is absolutely it's free, right? Um, that's me being a, a European socialist, right? I got this view that's kind of like education should be a human right and not a privilege of the wealthy. So we made this thing available. And what's interesting is people come along. And we say, we're not being paid anything. We're not going to pay you anything, but we can share your passion for architecture. And people are doing that, you know, and there's this resource. And frankly, in terms of AI, you need to have this kind of global platform where you can get this thing. So please make, make the most of that and have a look at what's going on there. Um, because uh, that's the only way to find out about these things because they're changing so rapidly. So anyway, yeah, that's fantastic. I, hope that was, I hope that was useful. It's just to go. Yeah, and, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, probably the topic is too, too, uh, too much to cover in just an hour. Yeah, it's... Um...